Welcome back to another Family History Friday video with the Butler Area Public Library. This week, we're going to talk about finding your ancestors on maps. So a question that we get all the time is wondering where an ancestor actually lived where their property was. An easy way to do that is to look at cadastral maps, which are land ownership maps, which were very popular and produced for pretty much every county in the United States in the late 19th century. So in this video, we're going to talk about where you can find those maps. Uh, we do have physical copies of them at the library, but you can also find scans of them online. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about how you look at them and what to do if you can't find your ancestor's name on the map, how we can use the information about their neighbors to locate them. So let's get started. The 19th century in the United States saw a huge increase in the publication of county land ownership maps, um, often referred to as cadastral maps. They show the names of landowners, typically the acreage or approximate bounds of their land and other landmarks within the county. And those are broken into two kinds of maps. So early on in the early part of the century and primarily in the 1850s, we see the creation of large wall maps. And these would usually be kept at county offices and government buildings, things like that. And they look like this. They're usually very ornate, um, hand colored. They'll have illustrations and a border, things like that. This is a map of Middlesex County, Massachusetts from the Library of Congress. And this is the 1858 map of Butler County, Pennsylvania. You may have seen a copy of this hanging on the wall in the genealogy department when you visit the library. Um, and as you can see, it's the full county, so it's primarily going to be useful for rural properties, not things within the cities themselves. By the 1860s, we see a transition to bound atlases that have a little bit more detail. So they look more like this. Um, they have page, individual pages for one or two townships, sometimes small communities within the county. And the other thing that we see are advertisements. So there was a trend to sell ad space in the borders to local business people and farmers and things like that. There was a way to drum up more funding for the making of these maps. The Library of Congress and their digital collections are a great place to start if you are looking for maps online. As you can see here, there are close to 2,000 county land ownership maps available for you to search. These cover not just the United States, but other countries. We can see here that this first result is actually from Ontario, Canada. You can use the search box to search the entire Library of Congress collection. Um, so you can even just put in a county or a city name to try and look for maps. And for those of us doing research in Butler County, Pennsylvania, there's one map in the Library of Congress holdings available online, and that is this 1858 map of Butler County. This is one of the wall maps that I was referring to. And when you're using maps on the Library of Congress site, when you find one, you'll get a sort of smaller thumbnail initially and some citation information that tells you the year of publication. To interact with this map, you'll want to just click on the image itself, which will bring you to a slightly larger image viewer. And you have the ability to use the zoom out and zoom in buttons to change the view of it. There's also a rotation button and these arrows that will allow you to go full page. You can also just click on the map itself, or if you have a scroll um, feature built into your mouse, you can use that scroll wheel to zoom in and out. There are also map collections available on Ancestry and Ancestry Library Edition. To find those, the easiest thing to do is to go to the card catalog first. To do that, you'll click on search at the top of the page and click card catalog at the bottom of the menu that opens up. Within that page, you can do a keyword search for map or a geographic location, 
or we can use the filtering options here on the left hand side. To do that, I'm going to choose the Maps, Atlases, and Gazetteers category. And so now you can see everything that we're looking at here are maps. Of course, since Ancestry is an international series of collections, we may want to narrow this down a little bit more. And all we'll have to do on the left-hand side is look at the Filter by Location section and click USA. Now you can see that we have just 11 sections of collections. Certainly feel free to look through all of these depending on where you are doing your research geographically. For Butler County researchers, where you're going to want to focus is this collection here called U.S. Indexed County Land Ownership Maps 1860 through 1918. You have two ways of working through maps on Ancestry. Some of these are indexed, as you can see with this collection, so you do have a search box here where you can try and search by name. However, I will caution that you'll probably only want to fill in a last name and the location, because as we'll see looking at a lot of these maps, often they are only labeled by surname or first initial and surname. So just keep that in mind when you're doing a search. The second way that you can find a map is to use the Browse This Collection box on the right-hand side here. And in this specific instance, they are sorted by state first, so we will just click this little menu. And for us in Butler County, I'm going to pick Pennsylvania, but certainly choose any state that is relevant to your research. And then we can see within Pennsylvania a list of all of the counties and years that Ancestry has maps available for. And for us, we have a Butler County map from 1874. I'm just going to click on that name to go to the map. And so this is a title slide. We can see down here that there are 52 images. So if we just use our navigation arrows and click right, now we see the title page of the actual Atlas book itself. A table of contents. So we can zoom in here and find the page number that we would need for the township or borough or village that we are interested in viewing. This atlas also has county maps of the state of Pennsylvania inside of it. And we can see on each of these pages that because this is an atlas, it is broken down into chunks of the county map with detail rather than just one big broad image of the county. This page has Washington Township and Venango Township. And we can see in the side column that there are some business notices for Washington Township because, as I mentioned before, they sold ad space and notice space to have the funding to put these maps together. Before you start looking for your ancestor on a map, I recommend that you make sure that you know where they were listed as residents in 19th century census records, especially those between 1850 and 1880, as that is the primary time frame of publication for these maps. Once you know that and the townships or towns that they live in, that's gonna help you narrow down where on the map to look. So, for example, if we are looking for the family with the last name Craig, who lived in Fairview Township on the 1860 census, um, I've got the 1858 county map of Butler County pulled up here. I am going to zoom in on Fairview Township, which is on the eastern side of the county. And as we look at the names here, I just visually skim around and I do see a parcel for Thomas Craig right here in the center of the township. There's also an A Craig right to the south of it. 
So you're just going to visually check for the name of the ancestor that you're looking for. When I'm working with the 1874 Atlas of Butler County, all I'll want to do first is make sure I refer to that table of contents to find what page the township I want is on. So if we're looking at Fairview again, that's on page 15. And so here on page 15, we can see the map for Fairview. And when I zoom in, we do see one Craig property here in the same sort of central geographic region. This is now a J Craig, first initial J. Uh, but we do see the family sort of located in the same general region. You will notice on this 1874 atlas that the names are indicated by little dots or squares on the map, but we don't get the actual property boundaries the way that we did here on the 1858 map. What we do get, though, is a little more community detail. So these circles with a dot in them, these are all oil wells. We can also see schoolhouses indicated. We also have a parsonage down here and a church. So you might get a better feel for the community at large off of an atlas, whereas on a wall map where they actually give you acreage boundaries, it may give you a better idea for the size of the property itself. These atlas versions of these ownership maps are going to be really helpful if your ancestor lived within a borough or a village and wasn't a farmer. So if we look at the table of contents for the boroughs and villages, we can see that Fairview Borough itself has its own map on page 33. So here we can see the plan of the borough of Fairview. And if we zoom in, we can see the actual street names and the names of the owners of the lots in town itself, along with some outlines of the buildings. So this is going to be really helpful for you if you are looking for their business or their home. We can see the names. Um, sometimes they're indicated if they are a doctor. We can see that there's a hotel and a meat shop, a drugstore, a restaurant, a foundry. Uh, so certainly look for these atlas maps if you have ancestors who were living in towns not just out in the country. Here's another example, this time with the map of downtown Butler and the Butler Borough. Again, we can check all the street names, so if you know their approximate address, that's going to help. And then we can see that most of these little lots are labeled with the name of the owner and have some indication of what kind of building or at least the shape of the building was there. We also have a second map for Butler Borough. Rotate this. That shows a little bit closer of the outline of downtown. Here we can see the courthouse and the diamond. And the buildings and storefronts that bordered right along Main Street. So what do we do if we have an idea of where someone should be living uh, based off of census records and we've looked at the maps but we don't find them? That's when we want to return to our census records and look at a couple of factors, specifically the value of the real and personal estate listed on the census record and the names of the neighbors and the value of their estates. So for example, this J.S. Jameson and his family uh, lived in Fairview Township on the 1860 census and his occupation is a farmer. So one might expect that we would be able to find him on the map. Uh, but looking at this 1858 map of Butler County, there is no Jameson to be found. So I'm going to return to our census records and analyze it a little more closely. Now, looking at the headings of the census. Let's remember that in columns eight and nine, they ask each person enumerated or the heads of 
house who are enumerated, the value of their real estate, meaning their land, and the value of their personal estate, their belongings and effects. And when we scroll down and come back to Jameson, we can see that there's actually nothing filled in in the box for the real estate, and the box for his personal estate is $275. So it's possible that he doesn't actually own land. Now let's look at some of his neighbors. And let's remember that the numbers here on the very far left are the dwelling houses in the order that they were visited. So typically these are going to be the close neighbors because the census taker is going to try and follow the most logical path, the most efficient path to collect this data. So let's keep that in mind. So coming down here, the next house enumerated after Jameson is Paul McDermott. We can see he's also a farmer. His real estate is valued at $1,500. Looking on the other side of the uh, Jameson household, we have David Barnhart, farmer. His property is valued at $2,500. We have a Frederick Barnhart, farmer, whose property is valued at $5,000. And then I'm gonna check the pages on either side as well. So if we go one page to the left and take a look at some of the names, uh, we have a John Thorne, whose real estate is worth $2,000. A John Everhart, whose real estate is $600. And two Philip Barnharts, Philip F. and Philip M. Uh, their real estate is worth $3,750 and $10,000. So now that we have a list of some neighbors, I'm gonna to return to that 1858 map and see if we can't place these people onto the property. So now that we have a list of probable neighbors and associates, we're gonna look at our 1858 map for Fairview Township again, and just start skimming until some of those surnames hopefully pop out at us. And I do see a number of pieces of property labeled as belonging to people with the Barnhart family name. So we can see P.H. Barnhart down here, which is possibly one of those two Phillips, an R. Barnhart, a D. Barnhart, possibly David Barnhart, three other pieces of property own, uh, belonging to P. Barnhart here on the west and the north, a J. Barnhart, and then here, running vertically, a piece of property that is labeled Gall McDermott. Now, it's very possible that this G is just a typographical error from the map design, and this is our Paul McDermott, who is enumerated next door to Jameson on the 1860 census. And we do see some two different pieces of property with the Thorne name. Neither of them are the John Thorne that we saw on the 1860 census, but with further genealogical research and analysis, we might be able to connect either of these to the Thorn property in 1860. So as we can see, by looking for the names of these associates, we've narrowed down a much smaller geographic area that was likely where Jameson was living in 1860 when he was enumerated. So we can place him in this southwest quadrant of the township rather than simply placing him wildly in the Fairview Township area at large. We can also use information from the 1870 and 1880 federal census records to triangulate residences on the 1874 atlas. We may have to be slightly more creative. Um, we'll want to check both the 1870 and the 1880 census years for names to use simply because this atlas falls sort of smack in the center of it. We'll also want to pay attention to a few other clues because as we can see, the land boundaries aren't actually printed on the 1874 atlas. We only have the names. And then although in 1870, they do ask the value of real estate question. So we have a quick, easy visual clue for people who are more likely to be listed as landowners. In 1880, that question was not on the census. So we need to rely more on a comparison of names between census years and clues in the occupations themselves. So when I'm looking at the 1880 census, I may prioritize looking at people who are listed as farmer rather than farm laborer or milliner or just simply laborer. 
So using context clues like that is going to help us here. So for example, if I want to research more about the early life of L. Ray Caldwell, who we can see here is a 10-year-old living with his family on the 1880 census, L. Ray won't be listed on any map while he's just a child, so we need to focus on looking for his father, John Caldwell, who was a farmer. And looking at the 1870 census, still in Jefferson Township, they didn't move. John Caldwell is here at the top of the page. William E. is our L. Ray. And we can see that John, his father, was a farmer and his real estate was valued at $6,000. So it's pretty likely that we will find him on the map. And here in the Jefferson Township section of the 1874 Atlas, we do see one probable match, this J. Coldwell. So the name isn't spelled exactly right. So I'm gonna look for some other clues on these census records just to confirm with the neighbors and other properties in the area that J. Colwell and John Caldwell are indeed the same person. So in 1870, we can see that John Caldwell was living near a couple of other farmers with some sizable property. We have a Fulton Schrader here, John Schrader, Samuel Patterson, William Cochran, Patrick Graham, and then if we check one other page, we see a David Logan who has $12,000 worth of land. That's a promising neighbor. Matthew Cunningham, and George Meckling here who has $5,000 worth of land and Albert Schrader, $5,000 again. Coming back to our map and looking at our J. Colwell, sure enough, we see an F. Schrader, a J. Schrader, a P. Schrader, S. Patterson, probably our Samuel Patterson, G. Meckling, George Meckling, D. Logan, David Logan. Uh, so all people that we saw, A. L. Schrader, Al Schrader, all people that we saw listed on that 1870 census. If we want to be doubly sure, we can check the neighbors on the 1880 census as well. So checking 1880, here's our John Caldwell household. And the occupations are gonna be a little more helpful in this instance since we don't have that land value question, but the farmers nearby are William Harbison, Albert Schrader again. We'll skip William Fair because he's a laborer. Matthew Cunningham, Patrick Graham, Samuel Patterson again, the other Schrader household, Andrew Schrader, who is the son of John Schrader. And then we have a few people with the last name Wright, William Wright and Alex Wright, and John Arthur. So now that we have an idea of a few neighbors on the 1880 census, let's go back to that atlas again. So we have our Coldwell family, and sure enough, Samuel Patterson and the Schraders that we know lived near them in 1870, John Schrader, Fulton Schrader, and Al Schrader. We can also see the right names that we saw on the 1880 census, as well as the Arthur surname and the Armstrong surname. So by checking the information on both of those census records, we can be sure not just that we know the correct area that the Coldwell family was living here in the northwest corner of Jefferson Township, but that that slight spelling variation that appeared on the map is indeed the same person that we were looking at.